Welcome back. All right. So I just have to know, how has the day been? Good? Woo! Yes. Excellent. Well, we are, we are at the end of our time together, and I have the gift of being able to present our, end, our EndNote speaker. So my name is Kim St. Martin, just want to introduce myself. I'm the director of Michigan's MTSS Technical Assistance Center. I do have a public service annou announcement first. Okay, so someone has an orange Ford Escape. License plate number DWL9214. Can you please go see Diane Dick um, about the car? I know it sounds cryptic. I'm just doing what I'm told, guys. Just doing what I'm told. It's orange Ford Escape DWL9214. OK. So we have quite a gift this afternoon. And it's a great way to round out our time together. And there's going to be an opportunity at the end of the end, when the EndNote speaker has finished, um, Emily Hanford, we are going to bring up some of our, our researchers and presenters from today to join the panel in being able to answer some of the questions that you guys may have. So without further ado, let me just give you a brief introduction of, uh, for Emily Hanford. So Emily Hanford is a senior correspondent and producer for American Public Media. So her work appeared on NPR and in the New York Times, um, Washington Monthly, the Los Angeles Times, and other publications. She has won numerous awards, um, in, including a DuPont Columbia University Award, the Excellence in Media, reporting on educational research from the American Educational Research Association. Emily is also a member of the Education Writers Association, the uh, Journalist Advisory Board, and was also a longtime mentor for EWA's New to the Beat program. So for the past several years, she has been reporting on early reading instruction. And so some of you may have been following Emily Hanford since 2018. So her podcast, Hard Words, Why Aren't Kids Being Taught to Read, won the inaugural Public Service Award from EWA. Currently, her most recent podcast, Sold a Story, is available in some, I think many people here have actually had the gift of listening to it. And so it is, it is my pleasure to introduce Emily Hanford. Please join me in giving her a warm welcome. Everybody. Good afternoon. Good to see you after a long day. I was here this morning and um, I hope the rest of the day was, was fantastic. Thank you to the Michigan Department of Education, Michigan MTSS, Dr. Rice for having me here this afternoon and thank you all for being here and sticking around for this entire day. Uh, I am here to tell you some things that I have learned over the past few years about how kids learn to read. So I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about myself. First of all, what I'm not. I'm not a classroom teacher, I never have been. I'm not an education researcher, never have been. I'm not an advocate. I'm a journalist. I have been for about 30 years. I've been reporting on education and education only since 2008, so 15 years. A few things that I learned as an education reporter I do not think there is a profession more important, more essential to our society, our future, than education. So the work that all of you do every day is so important, so thank you. Give yourselves a round of applause. And something else that I have learned is that being an educator, a classroom teacher in particular, but educator in general, is difficult, challenging, exhausting work. You work a lot of hours, you're probably not paid enough, you probably think about your job all the time. You do this work because it matters, so thank you for choosing this profession and sticking with it and doing the hard work every day. So I am not here today to criticize any of you, to criticize teachers or educators at all. 
I am here today to tell you what I have learned over the past few years about the so-called science of reading, something I knew nothing about. But over the past five, actually about six years now, I've had the opportunity to read thousands of pages of books and reports and articles. I've talked to hundreds of people. I have visited 10 states so far to try to understand how reading is being taught in schools today. And what I have learned is basically this. Over the past 50 years or so, cognitive scientists and psychologists and neuroscientists and linguists and other researchers all over the world have conducted thousands of studies in labs and classrooms to try to figure out how people read, what children need to learn to become good readers, and what is going on when children struggle to learn to read. And they've learned a lot. But this mountain of scientific evidence about reading was not, for the, post, for the most part, making its way into schools. Teachers and educators were not, for the most part, being taught this scientific research in their teacher preparation programs. They were not taught this science in professional development they got on the job. In fact, some of what educators learned about reading and how to teach it turns out to actually be at odds with what this scientific evidence says. But as I said, I didn't know any of this a few years ago. I never really thought very much about how people learn to read. I think that I thought it just kind of happens with enough exposure to books. I don't remember much about learning how to read. And I think that's become, because it, be, it came pretty easily to me. So this is me. Can you see that? Yes. This is me. Yes. It's my first grade class picture. You can guess in your own little mind what year it is. I'll tell you at the end. <laughs> but like I said, reading came pretty easily to me. And it came pretty easily to my kids, too. So I have two boys. This is one of them. This is the younger one. This is a few months after he started kindergarten. He is reading a chapter book. And I really have no idea how he learned to do that. By the way, this kid is now almost 20. It's going to be 20 next month. He's a sophomore in college. School was a pretty good experience for this kid. And it was for my older son, too. And it was for me. I loved school. And I think it had something to do with the fact that reading came easily to us. But reading does not come easily to a lot of people, far more than I knew. And it doesn't have to do with intelligence. Some really, really smart people struggle to learn how to read. They can learn to read, but they need someone to teach them how to do it. So there was a moment when I started to understand this in a way that I never had before. It was the winter of 2016. I was in Connecticut on a reporting trip. I was interviewing college students who had been placed in remedial reading classes. And an instructor in one of these classes told me about a student she had had years earlier. The student's name is Sarah, and she really couldn't read much at all, and definitely couldn't spell. Sarah was in college because she wanted to be a nurse. She was really clear about that. The instructor could tell that Sarah was really bright and driven she wanted a college degree so she could be a nurse, but she wasn't gonna be able to pass the assessment that would get her out of that remedial English class. She was gonna get stuck there, a lot of people do. The instructor ended up petitioning the English department. She said, Sarah's really bright, can we come up with an alternative way of assessing her, give her a chance to pass this class so she can move on? And it worked. Sarah was able to pass the class, and the instructor, whose name is Jill, she lost track of Sarah after that. She thought about her sometimes and wondered what had happened to her. And then many years later, Jill was in the hospital having surgery and she woke up and there was Sarah. Sarah was Jill's nurse. So when I heard this, I thought, wow, I would really love to talk to Sarah. So Jill dug up an old email address and I wrote to Sarah and it worked. She wrote me back. And in the winter of 2016, I drove to her house in Connecticut in this 
big ice storm, actually, and we did a long interview where Sarah told me about her reading problems. So this is Sarah, and she had a newborn baby when I visited her. So this is the baby. The baby mostly slept in this little crib on the other side of the room while Sarah and I talked for a really long time. I do really long interviews. And Sarah told me her story about never learning how to read. Now it turns out that Sarah has dyslexia. So that was not something that was ever identified when she was a little girl. It was never identified when she was in school. Actually, it, it was never officially diagnosed. It's basically what Sarah figured out about herself eventually. So Sarah had strategies to try to get through reading, to get through written text. So there were a certain number of words that she had just memorized. She knew what they looked like. Looked like. So common words that she saw all the time. And then other words she would guess by looking at a few of the letters, thinking about something that makes sense. Problem was that she couldn't come up with a good guess a lot of the time. So she just skipped a lot of the words. And this way of reading was really time consuming and hard and confusing and she really couldn't focus on the meaning of what she was reading. So her main strategy was to avoid reading altogether. She just didn't do it. Her older sister would read stuff aloud to her. That was sort of how she got through elementary school, middle school, and even high school. She did get through high school, just kind of barely. Then she got stuck in that remedial class in college. She got saved by her instructor, Jill. She eked her way through college without opening a book. She told me never, really Sarah, never, never, she says. She never read a book in college. Her strategy was to pay really close attention to the lecture and the class discussion. She says she has a really good memory, and that's how she got a nursing degree. She memorized all the words that she needed to be able to read and write to communicate with the other nurses and doctors and the medical staff, but she really never learned how to read. And her story was really amazing to me. I just really hadn't ever thought about any of this before as someone who learned to read pretty easily. I had tons of questions after talking to her about dyslexia. I didn't know anything about it. I had lots of questions about why Sarah was never identified with dyslexia, why she didn't get help in school. She actually was put in special ed. She actually says that a teacher came and cut her bangs once because she said that her hair was too long and that was why she couldn't read. So this led to my next reporting project, which was in 2017. So it's an audio documentary and an article called Hard to Read. So Hard to Read is about why students with dyslexia have a hard time getting the help that they need in school. And as I said, I knew nothing about dyslexia. I didn't think I knew anyone who had dyslexia. Turns out I do. But I was hearing the same story from parents all over the country. First I was calling people in Maryland where I live, New York, I started talking to people in dozens of states, and I was hearing the same story, like the same exact story over and over again. And I'm sure many of you have heard this story. Here's how it goes. Our child started school, and we knew something wasn't right. We went to the kindergarten teacher, and the teacher said, don't worry, make sure you read lots of books to him, everything will be fine but reading was really hard for him. He just didn't seem to get it. We went to the first grade teacher and she said, don't worry, all kids learn differently, he will catch up. But he didn't seem to be making much progress. By second grade, he was avoiding reading. He was telling us he didn't wanna to go to school. The teacher said, we just haven't found your child the right book yet, it'll all come together in time. And here's what eventually happens if the family has time and money, especially money. The family pays for private testing. This private testing usually costs thousands of dollars. That is money that Sarah's family did not have. The family might pay for private tutoring, which is more thousands of dollars. That's more money that Sarah's family did not have. The parents of this child who is struggling to learn how to read might hire an educational consultant or an attorney or maybe both 
to help them fight for what their child needs. And all of this is not just really, really expensive. It's exhausting, it's frustrating, and it's really, really, really hard. And the parents begin to realize that their child may never get what he needs in school, or he is not going to get it fast enough, because now he's eight or nine or 10 years old, and he really doesn't like school. And he's falling behind in other subjects because he cannot read very well. And maybe he's beginning to act out in school, or maybe it's manifesting as anxiety, depression, and withdrawal. And this is when, if they have the resources, the family might pull their child out of public school. Maybe they homeschool him, or maybe the family figures out a way to come up with the tens of thousands of dollars that it can cost to send the child to a specialized private school if there is a good private school nearby. And that is a big if in a lot of parts of this country. So here's the situation that I was beginning to realize that we're in. If you can come up with the money to pay for it, you can probably find a way for your struggling reader to be taught how to read. But if you don't have the money and your child is not learning how to read in school, what do you do? The equity implications of this are stunning. If you are from a low or even a moderate income family, there's really no safety net. There's no backup if you're not being taught how to read in school. As one mom put it to me, getting help for a struggling reader is a rich man's game. So we're talking about reading. This is the most basic and fundamental skill. It is the foundation upon which all academic learning gets built. That is a rich man's game. So how did that happen? And how is it allowed to continue? So this led me to the next reporting project called Hard Words, which was mentioned earlier. So Hard Words is from 2018. And it's also an audio documentary and a podcast episode and an article. And this is about core reading instruction, right? So not what needs to be done for struggling readers in particular, but rather, what do all children, what do all people need to learn to become good readers? Because here's the bottom line from decades of scientific research on reading, and I know a lot of you know this. What kids with dyslexia need to learn to become good readers is not substantially different from what all kids need to learn to become good readers, right? We all need to learn the same things to become good readers. Kids with dyslexia will need a more intense dose of a certain kind of instruction, but all kids can benefit from the kind of instruction that kids with dyslexia desperately need. Now, hard words focus quite a bit on phonics and phonics instruction. And it focused on phonics for two big reasons. So one, as I'm sure you all know, phonics has been the focus of so much debate and controversy for years, hundreds of years actually. When people are fighting about reading, they're usually fighting about phonics. So it is like the lighter fluid in the wars about reading. And you can find fights about phonics going back to the beginning of public education in America. The other reason I focused on phonics instruction is because what scientists have discovered is that phonics skills are critical when it comes to becoming a good reader. Why? Why is that? This is what everyone needs to understand. Because the starting point for reading is sound. So what a child has to figure out to become a skilled reader is that the words that she hears and knows how to say are made up of speech sounds. Those are phonemes. And she has to understand that in a language like English, an alphabetic language like English, phonemes are represented by various letters and combinations of letters. And this is something that human beings have to be taught. Reading skill does not develop naturally in response to being read to. This was a huge aha for me. Learning to read is not like learning to speak. So you immerse a child in an environment of spoken language, and unless she has a hearing problem or a severe developmental issue, she will learn to speak her native language. But not so with reading. Immersing children in a literate environment is not enough. It's really important, but it's not enough. 
We aren't born with brains that are wired to read. We just, they're just not meant to do it. And that's because us human beings invented written language just a few thousand years ago, right? We've been around for a lot longer than that, talking to each other and developing spoken language, but we just invented this reading and writing thing kind of recently. So children need to be taught how their written language works. Some children, it turns out, don't need very much instruction, like me and my kids. But some children need a lot of instruction. So you've probably seen this. It is called the ladder of reading. So um, this slide compiles estimates from a number of studies. It's made by a woman named Nancy Young. She's in Canada. You can find the citations on her website. She has the citations to the studies. So what this slide shows is that about, roughly, 40% of kids are going to learn to read no matter how you teach them. A little bit of instruction and immersion in a literate environment is probably going to do the job. But more than half of kids, more than half, maybe 60% or so, are not going to learn to read very well unless they are explicitly taught how to do it. And like I said, some kids are going to need a lot of that explicit instruction. So a key thing for everyone to understand is that all kids can benefit from this explicit instruction. Even those kids like me who may not need it can become better readers and especially better spellers if they are taught how to read and spell. So no one is arguing that phonics instruction is all children need to become good readers. It is not. There is much more to teaching a child how to read than phonics instruction. To understand why, it's helpful to know how kids learn to read. And I know some of you are in some great sessions earlier where you went over some of these same basics. So the simple view of reading. It's a really good place to start. I think many of you know about the simple view. A really important thing to say here is that the simple view of reading does not say that reading is simple. To the contrary, reading is very complex. The simple view of reading is a simple model to understand a very complex process. The simple view was first proposed in 1986. I was in high school at the time, so there's a hint as to when that photo was taken. So in 1986, I was in high school, and these two researchers, Philip Goff and William Tunmer, proposed this simple view of reading. They proposed this model because they were trying to clarify the role of decoding in reading comprehension. There was a lot of fighting going on at the time about phonics instruction, right? So they were trying to understand the role of phonics, the role of decoding, when it comes to reading comprehension. Because everyone, everyone agrees that the goal of reading, the goal of teaching a child to read, is to comprehend text. Everyone agrees on that. The question is, how does a little kid get there? The simple view says that reading comprehension is the product of two things. Not the sum, but the product. So one is your ability to decode words. You see the letter string R-E-A-D-I-N-G, and you know that that string of letters represents the word reading. The other part of the equation is your language comprehension. So that's your ability to understand spoken language. So we're not talking about your ability to read text. Language comprehension is your ability to understand meaning when someone is talking or when text is being read out loud to you. So for example, when someone says to you she is reading the book, you know what the verb means in that sentence. You know what she's doing. So the simple view says that if you have really good language comprehension skills, but zero decoding skills, your reading comprehension will be zero. Because zero times anything is zero. And there are lots of kids out there like that. They're very precocious little kids with their language ability, but they really don't know much about how to read the words. Most kids are like that when they come into school. The simple view also says that if you have really good decoding skills, but very poor language comprehension skills, you just don't know the meaning of that many words in spoken language, your reading comprehension is not going to be very good either. So most kids entering school have very little when it comes to the decoding part of the equation. 
They have zero or close to zero when it comes to the D in the simple view of reading. But they do have something when it comes to the language comprehension part of the equation. In other words, when children enter school, they know the meaning of lots of words, but they don't know how to decode those words yet. This is why people familiar with the so-called science of reading call for an emphasis on phonics instruction in the early grades. Because if the goal is to get to reading comprehension, and you have a bunch of five and six-year-olds who have language comprehension skills, but virtually no decoding skills, you need to help those children develop decoding skills. But the simple view clearly shows that focusing only on decoding would be a really, really big mistake because it's only part of the equation. And as you all know, kids come into school with very different language comprehension skills. Some kids know the meaning of lots and lots and lots of words, and some kids have far smaller vocabularies. So reading instruction that aligns with the simple view has to focus on the language comprehension part of the equation too. So that means lessons and activities that expand children's oral vocabularies. I was in a first grade classroom a few years ago where reading instruction was deliberately aligned with the simple view of reading. And what I saw was explicit phonics instruction in one part of the reading instruction, and the kids were broken into small groups depending on the level of their decoding skills, because you can have a very big range of levels in a first grade classroom. And another part of the reading block was explicit vocabulary lessons and lots of reading out loud by the teacher. So the words that the kids had learned during the course of the school year were posted on cards all over the classroom. And this was, I think, March. So there were lots and lots of words everywhere. They were actually taped up on the window. You couldn't really see out some of the windows. So the words that these kids had been learning included words like gigantic, extraordinary, neighborly, and ridiculous. So those are not words that the vast majority of first graders are going to be able to decode and they shouldn't be expected to. But the first graders in this class, they were learning the pronunciation and meaning of these words so that when they're able to decode them, they will know what the words mean. As I said, and oh, by the way, this class, every single child in this class spoke English as a second language, and several of them spoke English as a third language. So the simple view of reading was proposed as a theoretical model back in 1986. And the basics of this model have been confirmed by research over and over and over again. And the simple view is helpful because it disentangles some of the stuff that is most contentious and always has been in the debates about reading and how to teach it. In what's known as the whole language view and in the balanced literacy view more recently, the focus right from the start of reading instruction should be on getting kids to focus on the meaning of what they're reading. Whole language and balanced literacy are meaning emphasis approaches to reading instruction. As opposed to what's known as a code emphasis approach, which emphasizes decoding skills at the beginning of reading instruction. Early reading instruction that aligns with the scientific research is a code emphasis approach so that kids can get to meaning. Everyone agrees that meaning is the goal. The question is, how does a little kid get there? So this is another model that I know many of you have seen called Scarborough's Rope. Hollis Scarborough is a psychologist at Haskins Lab. She started studying reading development back in the 1980s. A lot of really interesting work was happening in the 80s. Um, Scarborough's Rope helps unpack what goes into each side of the equation that was put forth in that simple view. So the upper strand is language comprehension. And what's so interesting is this model shows that language comprehension in and of itself is quite complex. It's not just all the words that you know the meaning of an oral language. It's also your level of knowledge. It's the stuff that you know. And it's your understanding of how language works. Language structure, grammar, your ability to make inferences and understand things like metaphors. There's a lot to language comprehension. This is sort of a more nuanced explanation of what goes into the language comprehension part of the simple view equation. And I think it can help teachers and parents understand what might be going on when kids are decoding well, but they're still struggling with reading comprehension. Very often, they have a language comprehension issue. The lower strand of Scarborough's rope is the word recognition strand. 
And this is interesting because it shows that without good word recognition skills, you're not going to become a skilled reader. But there's a lot that goes into word recognition. It's complicated, too. So the, wraps, uh, the rope sort of unpacks the various skills and abilities that go into that part of the equation. So you can see one element is decoding. So that's basically your phonics knowledge. Do you have a good understanding of how letters and combinations of letters represent the sounds in words? Teaching students the basic letter sound combinations in the English language gives them access to successfully sounding out more than 80% of the words in English print. That's a lot of words, but it's not all the words. Children need more than just phonics knowledge to be successful with written English. That's why I think it's more useful to think about teaching children how their written language works. Rather than using phonics, this is about how their written language works. English spelling is not just based on the sounds and words. English is a morphophonemic language, which means that our spelling patterns are based on both sound and meaning. So to understand English spelling, and that's really what we're talking about here, kids should be taught some morphology. In other words, they need to understand the meaningful parts of words and how English words are put together. Prefixes, suffixes, root words. And some etymology is really helpful too and really interesting. That is, to understand English spelling, it helps to know something about the history of our language. So English has this reputation for being a wacky language that's full of exceptions, but really it's not. It's a melting pot language that has complex spelling patterns because English has roots in Greek and Latin and French and Native American languages. English is really fascinating, but written English is perhaps the most difficult alphabetic language to learn. It takes two to three years for a typically developing reader to master the basics of written English. In contrast, it takes only a few months for most kids in Italy to learn how to decode Italian. Because Italian spelling is almost perfectly regular. Italian is spelled the way it sounds. Spanish, too. I think one of the reasons we've fought so much about reading instruction in the English-speaking world, because we fight about this all over the English-speaking world, is that there is a lot to teaching children written English. So there's a lot to know to teach little kids English, and there's a lot to argue about in terms of how to teach it. So back to Scarborough's rope and the elements of the word recognition strand. So there's phonological awareness, understanding the sounds in words. There's decoding, understanding how letters represent those sounds. And then also there's this thing called sight recognition, which in my opinion is where things get really interesting. So when you are a skilled reader, you don't actually decode, have to decode most of the words you encounter. When you see a word that's familiar to you, you know that word immediately on, on sight. You don't have to consciously, laboriously sound it out. Scientists refer to the words that are instantly recognizable to you as sight words. But this term, sight words, is kind of confusing because teachers and reading scientists usually mean different things when they use that term. I think sometimes the things we fight about are people are meaning different things when they say the same thing, right? So sight words in schools, sight words are typically words that kids are supposed to memorize. They may be words with unusual spellings that are difficult to decode. They may be words that kids are going to come across a lot in their reading, in other words, high-frequency words. So children often come home with these words on flashcards, and they're supposed to memorize them. But what the scientific research has shown is that having kids memorize lots of words is not the best path to good word recognition skills. And it turns out that weak word recognition skills are the most common and the most debilitating source of reading problems. Struggling readers may also have language comprehension issues. Often they do. But when children do not get off to a good start with decoding, it has an impact on the continued development of their language comprehension. And eventually, kids may be weak on the language comprehension side because they are weak on the decoding side. This problem has been described as the Matthew effect, which is a biblical reference. Basically, when it comes to reading, the rich get richer. Here's how it works. If you come into school with lots of language comprehension, but you struggle with learning how to decode the words, your ability to continue to develop language comprehension may be impeded because one of the best ways to increase your knowledge 
and your vocabulary and your reasoning and your understanding of the structure of language is through reading. In contrast, if you come into school weak on the language comprehension side, but you are taught how to decode, you have just been given the gift that is your best bet for gaining knowledge and vocabulary because you can read the words. This is why equity in education begins with good phonics instruction in the early grades. It is one of the most important things that teachers can do to try to even the playing field between kids who come from homes that give them an edge on the language comprehension side and kids who come from homes that may not be as rich and resourced when it comes to vocabulary development and access to knowledge. Good phonics instruction is where educational equity begins. It does not end there, but it is a foundation. Now the good news, of course, is that most schools are doing some kind of phonics instruction these days. Publishers and authors of curriculum materials know that if their stuff is going to have a chance of being considered research-based, there has to be some phonics. And if they didn't know that or believe that until recently, they're quickly adding a phonics component now. So that means we must be on the right path, that reading instruction is finally starting to line up with the scientific research. But I'm not sure that's the case. Because while more and more schools are adding a 20 or 30 minute phonics block, what I also have seen over the years in schools are things like this. These are word reading strategies that I'm sure you all know. I've seen these strategies everywhere. They're on posters, uh, they're on bookmarks that get sent home with kids, um, they're on Pinterest, they're on Teachers Pay Teachers. There are also things like this. So this was given to me by a mom. Uh, who, her son came home with this in his backpack. So these are all strategies for kids to use when they're reading and they come to a word they don't know. And they really, they seem sensible. Like you get to a word you don't know, what can you do? You can look at the picture to try to figure out what the word might be. You don't want to completely guess, so you can look at the first letter, like Sarah did. Looking at some of the letters will narrow your choices, help you come up with a good guess. You can then check to see if you're right. You can reread the sentence using the word and see if the sentence makes sense. And if you're stuck, you can just skip the word and move on. Hopefully you can get the gist of the sentence anyway. So what's up with this? What is the idea about how reading works that these strategies are based on? What is the idea about how kids learn to read? This is what I started to get really interested in a few years ago when I was seeing these things all over. What is up, what is the idea about how kids learn to read? So these strategies are, whoop, there we go. These strategies are rooted in a theory about reading that came to be known as cueing. Not everyone calls it that. The idea is that readers use different kind of information or cues or clues to identify words as they're reading. And this theory was first proposed back in the 1960s. The basic idea behind the cueing theory is that readers don't have to sound out written words to know what they are. They can. They can sound out the words but they don't have to because there are all these other strategies they can use to figure out the words. So they can do things like look at the first letter of a word, use the context, think of a word that makes sense, use the pictures. There we go. So I got really interested in trying to understand the history of this. So I did this reporting project back in 2019 that was called At a Loss for Words, and it's about this theory of reading, this cueing idea, and the word reading strategies based on this, and how they became foundational in reading curriculum, assessments, and intervention programs that are really popular in American schools, especially in American schools that say they use a balanced literacy approach to teaching reading. But this cueing theory isn't right. It's not how skilled reading works. And it turns out that cognitive scientists showed this back in the 1970s and 80s. So skilled readers do not use cues and context to identify the words as they're reading. In fact, what scientists discovered is that that's how poor readers read. Poor readers often have a hard time with word identification. Too many of the words that they come across are kind of little mysteries series of letters that they don't know and they can't quite figure out. 
So they use a bunch of other strategies to try to figure out what the words say. When they come across a word they don't know, they look at the first letter, first few letters, the last letter, they try to think of a word that makes sense. In other words, they use context to think of a word that fits. And when they can't figure out what a word is using context clues, they skip the word. And often, they can get the gist of what they're reading this way. This is how a lot of people do it. But using context, guessing and skipping words, that's not what reading is like when you are a skilled reader. What cognitive scientists figured out is that a key difference, the key difference between skilled readers and unskilled readers, not the only difference, but a key foundational one, is that skilled readers can immediately and accurately recognize words. They don't need to guess or predict or use context. Skilled readers, it turns out, know tens of thousands of words instantly on sight. You need to know tens of thousands of words instantly on sight to be a quick, accurate, fluent reader. In fact, if you're a skilled reader, your brain has gotten so good at reading words. Remember, your brain wasn't supposed to be good at it, but you can get really good at it. Your brain has gotten so good at reading words that you actually process the word book faster than you process a picture of a book. So how did your brain get so good at that? So it happens through a process that some people call orthographic mapping. So knowing a little bit about this orthographic mapping idea, I think is really key to understanding why teaching kids how to decode words is so important. And for understanding why teaching kids the strategies, the cueing strategies, is not a good idea. So here's a really quick and simplified explanation of what orthographic mapping is. Orthographic mapping is the process we use to store printed words in our long-term memory. The way you do that is by attending closely to how a written word is spelled and then linking that sequence of letters to the word's pronunciation and its meaning. For a really basic example, a child knows the meaning and pronunciation of the word cat. The word gets orthographically mapped to her memory when she links the sounds cat to the written word C-A-T. So this requires an awareness of the speech sounds and words, that's phonemic awareness. It also requires an understanding of how those sounds are represented by letters, that's phonics. So you, you got to have phonemic awareness and phonics to orthographically map words into your long-term memory. And once a word has been orthographically mapped to your memory, you know it instantly on sight. In fact, you cannot suppress your ability to read that word. You don't have to consciously sound out the word when you see it, but you know the word instantly because at some point you successfully sounded it out. And you linked the spelling of the word in your mind with the meaning and the pronunciation of that word. So by about second grade, a typically developing reader who has some good phonics skills needs just a few exposures to a word through its pronunciation, its spelling, and its meaning. Three things. And bam, the word is mapped to her memory. And the more words that a reader maps to her memory this way, the more she can focus on the meaning of what she's reading. She's not using her brain power to identify the words. She's using her brain power to understand what she's reading. And that's the goal, for readers to understand what they're reading. Let me give you another example of orthographic mapping, which pertains a little bit more to older kids. So when my older son was in about 10th grade, he was reading something out loud to me, and he said, epitome. I stopped him and asked, epitome, do you mean epitome? Right? Oh, he said. So you could like practically see the light bulbs going off in his head, epitome. So my son had obviously heard that word before. Maybe he had sort of a basic gist of it kind of idea of what the word means. He may have come across the word in print before too, paused, sounded it out, which is what we do when we come across a word we don't know for good readers, epitome, hmm, I don't know that word. So we just kind of skipped it. But now, reading out loud to me, he had that little aha moment that he needed to realize that's a word I've heard before. So we briefly discussed the meaning of the word. Here it is, right? A person or thing that is a perfect example of a particular type or quality, epitome. So next time my son sees that word in print, he's going to know what it is. And the science suggests that with another few exposures, that word will be stored in his memory. He'll see it and he'll know it. The spelling, the pronunciation, and the meaning, it's all going to be there for him in an instant. 
What scientists have discovered is that skilled word reading is like a reflex. It's not a detective game. It's not contextual guessing. It's not a series of strategic actions. It's automatic and it's effortless. However, as you can see in the example of my son, there is much more than decoding skill at play. Readers must have a good oral vocabulary. My son had heard the word epitome. The light bulbs wouldn't have gone off for him if he hadn't. So your ability to comprehend what you read is tightly linked, very tightly linked to your vocabulary and your knowledge. This is one reason that reading scores tend to be associated with family income and educational background. Knowing the meaning of lots of words gives you an advantage. It gives you a very big edge when it comes to orthographic mapping and when it comes to understanding what you read. And having a mom who hears you read epitome and clues you into the fact that the word is epitome, that helps too. Family background matters. It can tilt the scales in your favor, especially on the language comprehension side of things. But having a big oral vocabulary and lots of knowledge is not enough. By some estimates, a third of so-called struggling readers are from college-educated families. Children need to be taught how to read the words on the page. They need to be taught how their written language works. And when teachers use the cueing system that I told you about, when they teach all those word reading strategies, they can actually impede the orthographic mapping process. So let me explain this with a story. These two girls are first graders in Oakland, California. They're actually now in middle school. A literacy coach who worked with these girls when they were in first grade came to see that teaching the cueing strategies was actually making it harder for many of her students to learn how to read. This literacy coach's name is Margaret Goldberg. She was hired by the Oakland Unified School District in 2015 to teach leveled literacy intervention. So LLI is a reading intervention program that I'm sure most of you know that does include some phonics instruction because remember, one of the cues for figuring out a word is to use the letters. But LLI is rooted in the idea that letters are one way to figure out a word. So kids are also taught that when they come to a word they don't know, they can use pictures and context to try to come up with the word. So Margaret Goldberg started teaching LLI, and around the same time, she found a bunch of unopened materials sitting on a shelf in her school gathering dust, which I'm sure is familiar to many of you also. And it was a systematic phonics and phonemic awareness program that teaches kids that when they come to a word they don't know, they sound it out. It teaches them how to sound out the words, and it doesn't include the cueing strategies. And in this phonics and phonemic awareness program, the beginning readers practice reading in decodable books that contain words with spelling patterns they've been taught. So they don't have to guess at the words. Margaret started teaching some of her groups of students LLI with the cueing strategies, and some of her groups she taught this systematic phonics and phonemic awareness program with none of the cueing stuff. And she started to notice differences between the two groups of kids. Not just in how well they were reading, but in the way they approached their reading. So she and a colleague recorded first graders talking about what makes them good readers. So I'm going to play this for you. It's a video. Mia's in the white shirt. She was learning phonics and no cueing. And Jabria is the girl in the pink jacket. So she was taught the cueing system. Here's what they say. Yes. What makes you good readers? I learn a lot. Because I look at the pictures and I read it. Do you remember when you were little and you didn't know how to read? Yes. Like when you started Kinda. kindergarten? Yeah. What helped you learn how to read? How did you learn? By looking, looking at, at the, the pictures. Anything else? Looking at the words and sounding them out. So Margaret Goldberg was seeing this over and over again with these two groups of students. So one group of students was taking away from their reading instruction that reading is about looking closely at words and sounding them out, as Mia said. And the other group of children was learning that when you come to a word you don't know, you don't have to look carefully at the word and try to connect the spelling with the pronunciation and the meaning. Instead, you can look away from the word. You can look at the pictures, you can look at the other words in the sentence, 
Basically, you search around for clues to help you identify the word. But remember, orthographic mapping requires you to look carefully at words so your brain links the spelling with the sounds and the meaning. And cueing teaches kids that they can look away from the words. So here's what Margaret Goldberg said to me about the kids in her LLI groups. She said this, I did lasting damage to these kids. It was so hard to ever get them to stop looking at a picture to guess what a word would be. It was so hard to ever get them to slow down and sound a word out because they had had this experience of knowing that you predict what you read before you read it. So as Margaret was noticing the differences between her two groups of kids, she was discovering for the first time the scientific research on reading. It was not stuff she had ever been taught. She was really pretty shocked by what she was learning and how different it was from what the curriculum materials were telling her about how reading works. But what Margaret was learning from the curriculum materials about how reading works is what lots of teachers are learning about how reading works because instructional approaches that include the cueing strategies are all over American classrooms. Kids all over the country are not being taught what they need to know about written English in order to actually read the words and eventually become good readers. This has consequences. So this is what the words say, which is an article in a podcast episode that I produced back in 2020. And it starts with a visit to a juvenile detention center where you will find an awful lot of struggling readers. I went to the juvenile detention center to meet kids who were being taught how to read while they were locked up. In one of the kids I met was a 17-year-old, I'll call him Deshaun. I asked him what he remembered about being taught to read in school. It was hard, he said. I didn't understand the words. I asked what he was learning in his reading lessons while he was in juvenile detention, and he said to me, he kind of lit up when he said this, he said one of the things he learned is that PH makes the F sound. Like physics, he said, kind of delighted. I never knew that. Now, I don't know if Sean was Deshaun was taught the cueing strategies, but he didn't learn what he needed to know about how written English works until he was 17 when he was locked in a juvenile detention facility. I know you've seen these numbers. <clears throat> these are NAEP scores, the National Assessment of Educational Progress. This slide actually shows the NAEP fourth grade reading scores before COVID. Okay, so things, as you all know, are worse now. These are the 2019 NAEP scores. They showed that more than a third of fourth graders could not read at a basic level. I think we should all focus on that, basic and below. It's really alarming. We're not talking about proficiency here. We're talking about just basic. More than a third of all fourth graders could not read on a basic level. And the slide shows differences among ethnic and racial groups. So I want you to notice here that more than half of all kids at basic or below in every subgroup except Asian Pacific Islander, which is close to half at basic or below, and now look at the gaps among the groups. 82%, and it's worse now, of black fourth graders at basic or below. More than eight in 10. Think about that. A class of 20 black children and only four of them are proficient readers. Scores on this test have changed very little since the early 1990s when this version of the test first started being given. Why is that? When I hear people try to explain these scores, something I almost always hear is poverty. Poverty is always in the explanation. And I'm not saying that poverty has nothing to do with it. Poverty absolutely plays a role, especially on the language comprehension side of things. But I think we've been blaming poverty when part of what's going on here has to do with wealth. Some kids are lucky enough to be born into families that can take care of the problem if they are not taught how to read in school. They have that safety net. The safety net is their parents and their parents' checkbooks. Some kids are getting the instruction they need, but lots of kids aren't. This really is an equity issue. It's a civil rights issue. So Soul to Story is the most recent project. It came out last fall. So it's six episodes. It's four and a half hours of listening. And really, it's about one idea. That's it, the whole thing, one idea. And the idea is beginning readers don't have to sound out words. They can, but they don't have to because there are other ways to figure out what the words say. 
This is a foundational idea of the balanced literacy approach to teaching reading. There was a time back in the whole language days when people were saying no to phonics instruction. There has been a strong anti-phonics trend in American education going way back to the 1800s and the very beginning of public education. But no phonics was a position that was increasingly hard to defend as the scientific research was coming out and showing that the ability to sound out written words is critical to becoming a good reader. So whole language kind of disappeared and instead schools were doing balanced literacy which sounds really good because who doesn't want balance? We need balance, more of it, in all things. And in fact, balance is what you want in early reading instruction, absolutely. A balance between teaching kids how to read the words and teaching them the meaning of the words, lots and lots of words, by talking to them and reading to them and having them talk to each other and teaching children things, knowledge about the world that will help them understand the words that they read. But balanced literacy gets some really important things wrong about the word reading part. By telling kids that they can sound out the words but they don't have to, and by not teaching them enough about how to sound out the words, balanced literacy ends up teaching kids the strategies of struggling readers. Some kids are fine because they do figure it out and they realize that sounding out a word is the most effective and efficient way, a reliable way to know what a word is. And they do use context to figure out the meaning of words. Good readers do this all the time. You come across a word you don't know, you sound it out. Is that a word I know? Maybe, maybe not. Let me think about that, this word, what it means based on the context here. This is how good readers use context. But struggling readers are using context all the time. Not just to figure out the meanings of words, but to identify the word itself. Reading is kind of a guessing game. And as a result, it's slow and taxing and it's hard to focus on the meaning of what you're reading because you're using so much of your brain power just to identify the words. A number of private reading tutors have told me that their biggest challenge in helping struggling readers is getting them to stop guessing at the words. And the older the child is, the harder it is to break that habit. The habit has been deeply ingrained. Tutors have to break the bad habits and help people learn how to actually read the words. In my work, I tend to use the phrase science of reading quite a bit. It's a phrase that a lot of people are using these days. And I used it at the very beginning. And it's just worth pausing for a moment to think about what that phrase means. So here's one definition from Mark Seidenberg. He's a cognitive scientist at the University of Wisconsin who's been studying reading since the 70s. So the science of reading is, according to Mark, a body of basic research in developmental psychology, educational psychology, cognitive science, and cognitive neuroscience on reading, one of the most complex human behaviors, and its biological bases. This research has been conducted for decades in the US and around the world. The research has important implications for helping children to succeed, but it has not been incorporated in how teachers are trained for the job or how children are taught. So notice that the science of reading is not phonics, it's not a program, it's not a curriculum. The word phonics isn't even in this definition of the science of reading. Every time reading instruction rises to widespread national consciousness, like it is again right now, the conversation ends up focused on phonics. One of the reasons that I use the term science of reading is really because I'm trying to indicate this big body of research. It's much bigger than phonics instruction. It's also much bigger than how people learn to read words. It's critical to remember that. Connecting research to educational practice is really essential. I know that's what you are all here doing and trying to learn how to do better because it's hard. And that means connecting all of this research to edu educational practice. It's not easy to do. It's a work in progress. Mark Seidenberg has written a lot about this. I, I highly recommend his book. I'm sure some of you have read it. <clears throat> It's called uh, Language at the Speed of Sight. He has lots of articles and blogs where he's written really insightful and important things about the effort to put science into practice. One of the things he's pointed out is that there is not enough research on how to translate scientific facts into effective practices. I think about this one a lot, even more since Sold a Story came out, because this podcast is having an impact on policy. Policymakers in at least nine states at last count are seeking or plan to seek bans on instructional methods rooting in the queuing theory that we focused on and sold a story. And as policymakers take things away, it's going to increase the pressure on schools to buy, no, buy new things. And I don't think any product is perfect. 
And it really is easier to say what's wrong with a product or an approach than it is to offer a replacement. I think the most important thing policymakers and school administrators can do right now is to invest in teacher knowledge about the science of reading. I know that's what you're all here doing today. The vast body of evidence about reading and how it works. Here's something that Seidenberg says in this blog post. He wrote, the science of reading movement has been enormously successful in raising awareness about the existence of basic research relevant to reading instruction. Many teachers have benefited from personal and professional development activities in this area. But, he adds, education is a massive enterprise with numerous stakeholders whose interests are not all alike. Creating the paths to meaningful change is difficult in this environment. Course corrections may be necessary along the way. I think it's really important for everyone to stay humble and curious in this endeavor and to stay open to course correction, to never believe so deeply in something and anything that you can't or aren't willing to wisely question it. Another thing I think is really important is for scientists like Seidenberg and journalists like me to recognize and acknowledge that we are not educators. Educators are really the ones who are gonna have to figure out the how of doing this. And it's gonna be hard, it is hard. I'm hearing from teachers all the time about how hard this is. There's someone who I think is writing a lot of really thoughtful stuff about this from the teacher point of view, about the science of reading, about figuring out how to teach based on that science, and how to move away from balanced literacy. And that person is Margaret Goldberg, the literacy coach I mentioned before. Um, she has a, uh, a blog and a website called The Right to Read Project. She writes about what was good about balanced literacy. Oh, I think I just forgot. Oh, here we go. Never mind. Okay. So, the, and there were good things, but at its core, balanced literacy as practiced in many schools does not line up with what the scientific research has shown about reading and how it actually works. So, Margaret Goldberg wrote a blog about moving away from balanced literacy. She wrote this a few years ago, and it begins like this. I understand why advocates, researchers, and policymakers who feel the urgency of our literacy crisis are frustrated when teachers don't embrace reading science. But my entry into the world of reading research was difficult. And while I take pride in my determination to learn, I understand why other teachers might be deterred. If we want teachers to apply research, it may be helpful to think about why they aren't. Asking teachers to move away from balanced literacy is asking them to break from the people and materials they have trusted, to abandon much of what they've been told about teaching, and to rethink things that may have inspired them to enter the profession. If we want teachers to walk away from a familiar and empathetic professional community, they need to be warmly welcomed into something new. And the piece includes this chart, which is probably gonna be hard for you to read, so I'll just read it really quickly and then I'm gonna wrap up. So here's what the chart says. In the balanced literacy community, I felt that I was an expert because I was told, you know your students best. But in the reading science community, I found that teachers were described as unprepared and ineffective. In the balanced literacy community, I felt that reading was described in terms that matched my own memory of learning to read, natural and magical. In the reading science community, I found that reading was a complex neurological process that I didn't understand, and phrases like curriculum casualties and reading failure terrified me. In the balanced literacy community, I felt that my role was simple and pleasurable because I believe students learn to read by reading. I match students with books while observing and encouraging their progress. But in the reading science community, I found that I'd be to blame if any of my students did not become skilled readers. In the balanced literacy community, I felt that I was a good reader. Books and articles were enjoyable, easy to read, and often included anecdotes to which I could relate. But in the reading science community, I found that articles included words I'd never encountered before, concepts I didn't understand, graphs I couldn't read, and references to studies I didn't know. In the balanced literacy community, I felt that I was welcomed and spoken to with respect, if not with admiration, by the presenters. They understood my job. I left with concrete strategies to try with my students the next day. But in the reading science community, I found that at conferences, I was not the intended audience, and comments about teachers not only made me feel unwelcome, but discouraged me from inviting my colleagues. 
I left rethinking important ideas, but without knowing how to apply what I had learned. And finally, in the balanced literacy community, I felt that I was aligned with my colleagues, my supervisors, the people who trained me, and the educators I knew to admire. But in the science of reading community, I became an outsider in my district, and until I connect with others, I felt alone. So you all are not alone, luckily, because you're all here. I think that's really exciting and hopeful and really good for the children in your schools. I will leave you with a reading list um, that I put together that's on the Soul to Story website. These are just some of the books and articles that have taught me the most over the past several years. You can find it on souldestory.org. There's also a discussion guide there for talking about the podcast with your colleagues. It was written by Margaret Goldberg with some help from me. We have questions for educators there. We have questions for parents, for community members, and for kids. So here's my contact information, and that's me again as a dorky first grader. So I don't know if anyone can, has any guesses about what year it was. 1975. Ah, close. 1976. Jimmy Carter was running for president. Jimmy, is he still alive? Um, Cognitive scientists were doing the first experiments back then that showed that the cueing theory wasn't right. So when I was in first grade is when that research really started getting going. Let me just say one thing. When I look at that picture of myself now, it's a little bit famous in my family, this dorky little picture. When I look at it, uh, I'm struck by something that I really didn't think about before I started doing all this reporting on reading. So many things I didn't think about until I started doing this reporting. But the school had us pose in front of a shelf of books. This was in the school library. I remember it. I loved the library. They sat us there with our little hands on an open book. You can actually see I have a little bit of nail polish, which means I must have just visited my grandmother because she always painted my nails red. And think about how awful that might have been for a kid who couldn't read. Think about how haunting it might be to look at that picture now of themselves when they were in first grade to be looking at it and thinking, I was supposed to be learning how to read, but I wasn't. And for so many kids, this is a secret that they carry with them for a long time until someone comes and teaches them to read, and that doesn't even happen for everyone. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you for being here. I'm looking forward to your questions and for having company up here on the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Emily. Thank you very much. You give, you've given us a lot to think about. And we'd like to take an opportunity at this time to take questions from the audience. So if you have a question, just uh, go ahead and stand up and we'll bring the microphone to you. It's hard for me to see. I know. <laughs> Anyone have a question? Okay. Uh, there's a question in the back. Here, she's coming with a microphone. Hold on. It's better when people can I got it, Shelley. carry a... Is anyone else coming up here? I, th I thought we had a crew. So my question is, if you, um, during your presentation, you talked more about the beginner readers, like from first grade and things like that. So if I'm at a space where the students are older and they've already reached me um, as a fifth grade teacher, how do I manage that? Um, in the same in that same vein, how do I take um, how do I get them to be more progressive readers? I'll say a couple of things and then I'll turn it over because I, that is certainly one of the there's a there are buckets of questions I get asked all the time and that is way up there. I hear from a lot of middle school teachers and high school teachers who are like, what do I do? And I think one of the things that's happening is many of those teachers have known for a long time that the kids are struggling. Uh, with reading, but some of those teachers are just realizing some of the core foundational problem that really is reading the words is really a problem for these kids. I'd actually really like to do more reporting on that, like what is successful. I know it's, you know, this is hard in the early grades, it's even harder in the upper grades, right? Because so many things are already working against you, just literally in time, terms of the way the day works. There's no time for it. There's no time left for being taught how to read. I think the one thing I can say though is if kids are really struggling, especially with those foundational word reading skills, and a lot of times that is a, a root cause, it may not be the only one, but it's usually part of what's going on, they still need to be taught that. It's never too late 
to teach someone how to read. And I have encountered so many people who've been taught how to read when they're 20, 40, 50, and 60 years old. And you can be taught, and if what you're struggling, you still need to be taught. So that is a difficult challenge for all of you in middle schools and high schools, but I think it's a challenge that, that all, everyone needs to figure out. How do we do this? What, what, are we, what is it gonna take to really help these older kids get on track and get on track fast? We need to get the early stuff right to try to prevent these problems. Preventing is much easier than remediating. But remediation is necessary. And some kids are gonna struggle even when core instruction is really great. There's still gonna to need to be good intervention. And so we can't forget that. Do you have anything you wanna add? Yeah. Is this on? Yes. Okay. So um, one of the, the document that was just recently released from the Institute of Education Sciences was a practice guide titled Provi Providing Reading Intervention for Students in Grades 4 through 9. And so it really is focused on uh, adolescence, and the adolescent literacy grade band is really grades 4 through 12. And so as, as an educator, you're teaching fourth or fifth grade, it is likely that you have children or students, adolescents, that are reading at a first and second grade level. And that does mean then that we have to have time in which they are provided with high quality, robust intervention supports. And within that practice guide, there are four recommendations. The first of which being that they have to be taught a strategy to decode multisyllabic complex words. Again, for many students, uh, that could be the primary difficulty that is preventing them from being able to read text, understand text. But there are other three other recommendations within that practice guide, which includes building fluency, automaticity, reading with expression, developing comprehension using a set of strategies, and then uh, our colleague uh, Michelle Alaya, who is here today, did a whole session on how to support adolescents in engaging in complex or stretch text, because we do have to be able, as we're teaching them to read, we have to be able to also help them navigate the materials that they are going to be having access to. So there are materials available through the QR code uh, related to the practice guide, and another session that was done on intensifying literacy instruction, which really mapped out a very systematic way to provide students access to intervention and ways to ensure that the intervention is intensified to meet their needs. We've got another question back here. Okay. Okay, you partly answered um, my question, but you mentioned queuing in this presentation, and I know that a lot of teachers use queuing for teaching reading. How do you combat that, reverse it? How do you get the older kids away from the queuing, especially when they're looking at the picture for the word, and you know that that's what they're doing. They're not sounding it out. They're looking for that, for that cue. As I said, I, I've been told by so many people that that actually really is the hardest thing, breaking the habit. So, I've, so I think two things need to be done, or this is what people have told me. This is what I've learned from people who are working with kids who are struggling at an older age, and this is a deeply ingrained habit, is you have to try to break the habit, and people come up with different games. Actually, there are some, you can see some videos on YouTube. There are some videos, like if you, I think if you put on YouTube, like breaking the guessing habit, breaking queuing, there are some, some videos there. Um, so they, they do need to be broken of the habit, and they also need to be taught how to read the words. They need to have a way, they need to learn that there's a reliable, better way to do it. But you really do have to, I think, do both at the same time. Yeah, I, I would agree. I do think that sometimes um, students, it is a hard habit to break because it's been functional, as functional as it can be for them, and that's what they've had to revert to using context, they've had to revert to using the picture. It's the compensatory strategy because um, our colleague, Dr. Anita Archer, how many of you have heard Dr. Anita Archer present? Right. Come up here, share with me. I'll share with you, yes. <laughs> Dr. Anita Archer, let me see some hands. Excellent, yes. Uh, Dr. Anita Archer has said there's no comprehension strategy more powerful enough to compensate for the fact that the students do not know the word. And so um, some of the text that we, when, when we're teaching kids how to use a decoding strategy to decode multisyllabic words, um, the type of text that we're using should be decodable and that there are multiple words that include those letter sound combinations and it is important that uh, at the younger grades especially, the pictures are not on the same page. So when I was actually teaching, you, they'd have the text, and then it wasn't until they turned the page where they could see a picture that could actually provide 
uh, you know, like a, a visual of what they were reading. But a lot of text, some people say it's decodable, but if you put the picture right there, then that is uh, what students do first go to, especially students who were trying to, to break this, this habit. So it takes practice, and it really takes a lot of effort on the part of the educator to motivate, reinforce students for um, you know, using these, these strategies. Can I say one other thing that I've heard from many teachers about older kids is one of the things you really need to acknowledge and deal with is like the emotion around it. Like it's very traumatic for a lot of kids. They have kept this quiet, this a secret for a long time. They're very ashamed and embarrassed. They're very resistant. They don't like reading. You do have to kind of help them with that one before you're going to break through to getting them to want to learn what you're trying to teach them, I think. I just wanted to start by saying that um, your reporting has not only elevated the voices of those advocating for science of reading practices, um, but it's also taken the muzzles off of our mouths and in some cases the targets off our backs. So thank you. Um, and, I, and I really loved when you said um, that it, we should never be um, in a position where we can never believe, or where we believe in something so deeply that we are never able to question it, um, that we should stay humble. And one of the things that I hear a lot in conversations, whether it's in the community or professionally, is, well, you know, there's research to show both sides. And well, that's that science, and then there's the other side. Um, and I keep on looking for that other side. And I'm curious, I know you probably get a thousand emails a second. Do you have anybody who has brought compelling research and evidence to you to kind of show a, a side that maybe points to something else? And if so, what is it? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's a hard question to answer because of, about what? I mean, obviously there's the work that I've done, as I said in here, does focus on, on a small part of this, right? So there is much more to this. And I think I just got very interested in reporting hard on this topic because it seemed no, so misunderstood. I just didn't, my sense was that a lot of educators just didn't know why they needed to teach kids how to read the words and what's and just how that works in our brains and that was so fascinating so i don't quite know i mean there's a lot of research on a lot of things and there's a lot of things that are still unanswered and i think there are some actually really important questions about the most effective and efficient way to teach kids how to read words i think some of the things that people are using to teach phonics may are not necessarily effective but we there's a the way that, it's not like this is, this is going to change, it's not like there's gonna be a big 180 on this. Like this is well established research about how our brains learn to read, how it works in our brains. Emily Solari is here. A lot of the questions about how to translate that into practice, we're still working on that one big time. Um, so I hope that answered your question. I guess we maybe have time for, oh we have time for a few more, 11 more minutes. Oh, there's a question in the back. There's some hand waving, and I don't know if someone else has a microphone right now. Come back up here. It's so light. It's so great. It's so Did you have anything to say to that one, by the way? No, no. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Oh, I'm sorry. Hi. Um, I, my um, area of focus is with multilingual learners, and when I was looking at the simple view of reading, I noticed that kind of a foundational assumption that you made was that the you know, language comprehension was there, um, and so we just needed to kind of add the decoding. In your research, have you found exemplars or, you know, what kind of information has come to you around that topic? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really important one, and I think that, that there is obviously, as you know, a lot of sort of debate and contention around this. I think, um, as I said in the talk, kids come to school with very different levels of language comprehension, and some kids don't have a lot of language or any language comprehension in English. I think the simple view of reading can really help you understand what needs to be taught to kids who speak English at home and kids who don't. Right? Reading comprehension is ultimately your ability to do decode the words and to have good language comprehension. Obviously, what kids who are learning English need is even more of that language comprehension, right? But it's not that they need that instead of the other part. They need the other part, too. Um, so I think, I think that the, the, at root, with some of the fights and problems we've had about reading in this country has been a confusion about the differences uh, uh, between 
uh, and, the, and, the, and the ways they complement each other, spoken language and written language. And it, this assumption that you really can detect when you dig, go down deep, that there's an assumption there that they're more similar than they are. They really are actually quite different, and they, they take different things in our brain. We need both of them to get to reading comprehension. So I think it's about disentangling and understanding the difference between the two and not assuming that a knowledge of spoken language is going to add up to an ability to read written language, nor the other way around. People will bring up the example, well, I can read Spanish really well because I know the pronunciation, but I don't know what I'm reading. Well, of course you don't because you don't have language comprehension in Spanish. So what you need to be able to understand what you're reading is the language comprehension in Spanish. It doesn't disprove the simple view of reading. It proves it. <laughs> it shows exactly that those are the two elements that are at play. Want to add anything to that? I do just want to give a shout out to our colleagues at um, Kelly Alvarez, um, Michelle Williams within Michigan Department of Education. We've been working with Claude, Claude Goldenberg, Elsa Cardenia Hagen, and talking about the science of reading as it relates to English learners. And so I just want to give a shout out to that. Um, more uh, modules, sessions will be coming uh, because there is a lot of confusion in the field about whether or not the science of reading is applicable for English learners and absolutely is. But there are some nuances. And so um, Kelly and Michelle and, and, other, and, and others of us are really working with some of the leading re researchers and Lexia to talk about ways to continue to build knowledge across the state. I think one of the places that it comes from, too, is this thing we keep getting to, that there's some zero-sum game involved here. That if we start like teaching kids how to read the words, that that's going to take away from the time we're spending on language comprehension. And obviously, that's the thing. That there are some kids who are more in need of that than others in our schools, and English language learners are the ones. But this isn't a zero-sum game. And yet, we know that one of the most precious resources in school is time and how you use time. So looking at things, time wasted is a big thing to look at. So. This is really difficult and really hard to figure out, and we shouldn't have to take anything away to add it in, but, but I think one of, the, one of the reasons I focused on the queuing stuff for so long is I think one of the things schools do very easily is add stuff, and that's more and more for teachers to do and figure out, but they don't take things away, and we do have to take things away, but I understand where the tension comes from, because people get, don't take away my thing. Don't take away the thing that's most important to the group of kids that I care about the most, that I'm most invested in because that's my job or those are my children or whatever. So I understand the controversy, but I think the answer is knowledge. People understanding how reading works and when you understand that, you see that these are not, they do not, we do not need to be in a fight about this at all. Hi, I have a quick question. I've um, been thinking about a way to articulate this. One of the threads through the conversation was how this can impact kids who are wealthy and or impoverished. Um, and thinking about well, what, what, what resources are available outside of school? Like how, does, how do we move forward? How do we connect parents and communities to things that can help them outside of school? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, kids spend a lot of their time outside of school. They also spend a lot of their time in school. And, when, and what we do know from a lot of research is that the language comprehension part of things, kids are getting a lot of that stuff outside of school. And, and school is probably never going to be able to make up for, for some of those differences. And yet looking at it with a, you know, uh, kids, all kids have like knowledge and things that they bring. And that was what this morning's talk was all about, right? There's all kinds of stuff that all kids bring to school and it needs to be acknowledged and nurtured. But to get very specifically to your question, I think with this whole thing about how many kids are struggling with reading is that I don't think schools can fix this problem on their own. I actually do really think we need communities to step up. I think there are resources. I think there's tutoring that needs to happen. Tutoring, having your own one-on-one -on -one tutoring has the greatest effects of anything in, in education research because why? Because it's one-on-one. -on -one. And one-on-one -on -one really is, that's what you want sitting on your mom's lap or your dad's lap. You're getting one-on-one -on -one attention. I really do think there's a role for the community to step up and get training on some of this and become tutors. And I think schools should figure out how to invite people in to do that tutoring. And we should give those people good training because there's actually a lot of wasted time right now and people who are trying to help kids learn to read and they're not taught anything about reading and how it works. They're not given good materials and they just sit there with kids and read with them and there could be a better use of time.
Yes, I think we are. Thank you, Emily. Can we have a round of applause? Thank you so much for joining us today and thinking about the how and why of reading. We want to leave with some resources that you will have access to that address both of these strands and sessions that we had today. It was a wonderful turnout. It was a lot of collaboration between different organizations and partners and internal MDE people and MTSS folks as well. We are so, so grateful. Um, so in parting, um, another round of applause for Emily. Thank you so much. And then we, like I, like I mentioned, we have been working at the Michigan Department of Education to provide you with guides and resources. So today you were given um, how to build diverse classroom libraries. Um, so we're really thinking about uh, the why, why kids read, why we get them connected, and the how how kids learn to read. Our dyslexia guidance you were also given today, and there were many references throughout our breakout sessions. We will continue to do this work, and we will continue to work side by side with you. Thank you so much. <laughs>